Now there are many ways your body is trying to tell you that you are sick. And there are many more ways that your body is trying to share the canaries in the coal mine that it may be getting sick. But are we listening? For thousands of years, doctors of traditional Chinese medicine have been trying to piece together what these little symptoms mean and what larger patterns of disease they are related to. They observe that, for example, a little bit of sourness in the throat was the earliest indication of gallbladder issues and many, many, many hundreds more examples of this. So in this video, I wanna share eight signs that your body is on the road to disease or maybe even has one going already. Hi guys, I'm Dr. Alex Hine, board licensed acupuncturist and doctor of traditional Chinese medicine and author of the health book, Master the Day. So let's jump in. Before we jump to the eight signs, I just want to remind you that these do not mean that you for sure have a disease. They also don't mean that you will be seriously ill or die from any of these, but they are the little warning signs, that little bit of indigestion before it means something much bigger, the little bit of blood pressure being high before it means something more serious, a kidney stone before it means something far more serious. And so our body is always trying to tell us through these subtle messengers that the balance of life life and death to some degree is being tilted in the wrong direction. I actually am working on a new book on this exact topic itself. So if you guys would like to be a part of the early bird launch list, just add your name below to the email list and I will let you know when I find out more information about this new book of mine I'm working on. So you can add yourself down there below. Sign number one, fatty liver. You know, one of my mentors best described fatty liver, non-alcoholic fatty liver, as something that is basically like the garbage from the middle burner, as we call it in Chinese medicine, the digestive system, accumulating some somewhere else. So this is a very distinct moment in history where you even have children developing what's called non-alcoholic fatty liver. And this is often related to people, for example, that have a high soda consumption or refined food consumption. This is obviously a disease of civilization of the modern world because in ancient times, you couldn't even put down that many calories to develop this to this degree and that young, which is very sad. Now, I like to think of fatty liver in the same way that I think of people getting fat or gaining weight. If you're eating too much or too much of the wrong foods, your body's trying to figure out where to put the excess of that overflowing cup. And one of the areas is fat, but also one of the areas is a fatty liver. Little sign and way number two, kidney stones. The way that we can think about fatty liver is almost conceptually as like the garbage from the middle burner, as we call it, from the digestive system, too much, not the right things. We can also think of kidney stones in a way as being the garbage from the kidneys. The kidney is not able to accurately process and get rid of these, let's just call them secondary byproducts, right? In this case, like for example, oxygen whether it's your diet is high in that or you're predisposed to kidney stones, it can also be related to calcium and there are dozens of different kinds of kidney stones. But you could also think of kidney stones in the same way, where there's either a functional issue with the kidneys themselves, there's a physiological issue throughout the body with the diet and the digestive system and the kidneys and the blood sugar, or underneath it all, there's an issue with all three, frankly. And so you have this accumulation of something that condenses itself into a stone instead of being passed frequently and regularly. So in traditional Chinese medicine, we say that kidney stones have two primary etiologies. One is what we call damp heat. Damp heat, you could almost think of as a chronic digestive problem that involves inflammation. So people who have high soda consumption, high sweet tea consumption, too much fried food, too many fatty foods, foods that we say generate heat in the body. And dampness, we say, is often a digestive problem related to bloating, for example. So we say that people generate damp heat in the lower burner. The lower burner is the genitourinary organs. Sometimes people have, you know, urinary dysfunction, they have burning or discomfort comfort with urination, that can be a symptom of that. Some women often have discharge. Issues like that can be related to damp heat. And the second condition is what we call kidney chi deficiency, which is a functional disruption of the ability of the kidneys to process basically what you're consuming through liquids. And so this inability, it's almost like someone keeps throwing snow on your porch and you keep trying to shovel it off and the snow keeps accumulating, you shovel it off. So what happens is eventually this begins accumulating, 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 and it aggregates. And then it passes with a lot of pain and bleeding, or we even need surgery to intervene on that. Now I've put together a list of as many practices as possible that are daily healing rituals that can potentially help you add years to your life with traditional Chinese medicine, by the way. So there are some rituals that if you do them daily can minimize the risk of developing these exact conditions. And it's the first link below this video. It's for a free guide on these four daily practices I would highly recommend from a traditional Chinese medicine point of view. So if that's appealing to you guys, you should check it out. Way number three your body tries to warn you is heart palpitations. P.S. It is a very common symptom. The majority of patients I see with heart palpitations do not actually have any cardiovascular disease, which is important to remember. Some do, some have atrial fibrillation, but the majority of people that walk into my practice, there's no actual issue with the heart or blockage of arteries. And what it is is primarily a disruption of the nervous system, right? Stress hormones can 
can easily disrupt the electrical signals going to the heart. It's the same reason why people with anxiety and panic attacks can experience identical symptoms as a heart attack, really. The chest pain, radiating sensations, anxiety, palpitation, really identical to a heart attack. Nervousness, nausea, they can throw up from anxiety, but that's purely from stress hormones and the disrupted electrical signals going to the heart. Why this is an indicator is because your body is showing you a fairly advanced form of physiological disruption from chronic stress, so pay attention. Warning sign number four, or way that your body tries to share with you something's up, is gallbladder sludge or stones. Now, a famous doctor in traditional Chinese medicine history named Li Dongyuan said that an excess of qi becomes heat. Now, in one way, we're talking about an excess of food has a sort of stagnating quality, right? And we all know the feeling of getting indigestion or acid reflux, but an excess of this food, the energy from food, can produce stagnation that is heat. You know where it is? It's in the gallbladder or the liver. This is often one of the predisposing factors for developing gallbladder issues, whether it's functional or a stone itself, or even fatty liver. You have people who are eating way too high calories, they are binge eating, or it's way too much heavy, greasy fried food, standard American diet. The body is trying to compensate, right? You put in a big meal, it's all these gastric juices and processes designed to help you digest that and absorb it and get rid of the waste. But when you're putting in too much, it's almost like your body's trying to squeeze, it's trying to get enough juice to digest all of this stuff you've put in your stomach. And so we talk about the localized heat and stagnation inflammation in the gallbladder. This is one of those predisposing factors. So if you're having gallbladder issues, pressure, right upper quadrant, pain, fullness, sensation after meals, very important to keep in mind because that is warning you of something that could lead to a gallbladder removal surgery. Pay attention. Now, in terms of gallbladders, for example, this is something I really want to share. I have dozens of case studies in my practice of people who come in who've seen a GI specialist that says you need a gallbladder removal surgery because they've had a few gallbladder attacks. In my experience, I have found that with a very high success rate, we are able to avoid them needing that organ removed. So I work with a limited number of new patients every single month in my clinic in Los Angeles or virtually via telemedicine. So if you guys would like to connect and learn more about booking a visit with me, just check out the info from my clinic below the video in the description or just go to dralexhine.com forward slash clinic. Now, weight number five your body's trying to warn you is erectile dysfunction. So for men, you might be thinking, oh, I'm getting a little older, late 30s, 40s, 50s, and it's not working quite as well. But what you don't know is that a high percentage of those guys have cardiovascular cardiovascular disease. They have heart issues. They have circulatory issues, which is why their best bud isn't rising to the occasion, pun intended, dad joke for the day. It's important because it is a functional issue of something else going wrong in the whole system, right? It's not just down there unless it's nerves. It is often a physiological issue with blood flow. So people very often have prediabetes or diabetes or cardiovascular disease they're not aware of. So it's very important to recognize that is just a downstream effect of having cardiovascular disease, early stages of it or advanced stages of it. It. Way number six, your body's trying to tell you you have a disease is if you have cardiovascular issues, right? And the reason why I view this as a disease is because look at how many organ systems and locations in your body come offline or online when you have an issue with cardiovascular health. Your libido, your blood sugar, your eye health, your kidney function, issues with, for example, headaches, like with hypertension, and even issues with like your mood and sleep can be related to cardiovascular issues. It is a widespread systemic dysfunction when you're having a cardiovascular problem, or if it's issues with, let's say, your actual heart itself, like you're having chest pain or chest discomfort. It relates to so many different systems in the body, and that's important to keep in mind. Way number seven, your body's trying to tell you that there's a disease is recurring sinus infections or UTIs. These are two of the most common chronic symptoms that patients come to me with that are taking recurrent antibiotics. I'm talking antibiotics once a month for years. Now, from my point of view, this is borderline malpractice. This is the standard of care in conventional medicine because they see infection and so they throw antibiotics at it because they have nothing else and to avoid getting sued, basically. But there's a very relatively easy functional treatment for these problems because they are functional issues. Recurring sinus infections, they are not typically structural issues. And I know your ENT has convinced you of otherwise, and that's ridiculous. That to me is a crime. The number of patients I've seen come from ENTs who've done all kinds of septum surgeries, balloon sinoplasty, and they're back to how it was, but now they have a structural change done. I could write a whole book on it. It's disappointing, I'll say. The reason why these indicate systemic issues is that, let's say chronic UTIs for women. This is indicating a chronic microbiome issue. And they typically don't just have chronic UTIs, they often have chronic digestive issues because the vaginal milieu, the environment, is the terrain. So it's very interesting to see that the two coincide and go side by side in their dysfunction. When they're working well, 
well or when they're not working well. The other one is chronic sinus infections. This is a chronic functional issue, not a structural issue, functional. Because how else could we get very amazing results in our clinic treating these with formulas? I'm not doing anything to the bone structure of the sinuses themselves, right? We're treating it from a functional point of view. And in the same way that the mucosa in the ear, nose, and throat organs can get disrupted, they can be treated from a physiological, a functional point of view. And most often, formulas are the way to treat this. Now, going back to why is this considered a disease? It isn't, but why is this considered a bigger issue? Because the number one correlation I see with people who have chronic sinus infections, not everyone, but correlation, very, very standard American diet, high in inflammatory foods, heavy alcohol drinkers, heavy smokers, and heavy coffee drinkers. So those all three, all four, generate what we call a lot of constrained heat or inflammation. And way number eight, your body's trying to tell you you have a disease is diabetes and the downstream effects of it. Diabetes I really do view as a disease because of all the systemic issues that can come from it. It can affect your eyes, right? Retinopathy. It can affect your kidneys, nephropathy. And it could also affect your nerves, right? Diabetic neuropathy. So there are all kinds of these downstream effects from blood sugar dysregulation that can be quite startling and that affect the whole system, the whole organism of the human body. So these eight factors are all key signs and symptoms that the balance is being tilted more towards disease and potentially chronic disease. And the longer they go untreated, the more they can potentially lead to more serious things. So they are just signs and symptoms that I want you to pay attention to because they can really help you quite a lot. Now, I've included some other signs and symptoms in this brand new online program, Introduction to Healing with Traditional Chinese Medicine. It's in the description below this video, but basically, rather than me having this channel full of sponsors and full of products that maybe aren't that really relevant to you or I don't believe in, I figure why not create a whole portal of learning with programs on how to heal with traditional Chinese medicine. The first one is the Intro to Healing with Traditional Chinese Medicine and talks about some little signs and symptoms of each organ system and how you know that these are precursors of potential actual diseases, right? How do I know that a little bit of indigestion is just that and not as a real disease like GERD? The videos in that program talk a lot more about that and it's very helpful to learn just from a one-on-one -on -one point of view. Check it out guys down below the video. And before you go, I have another related video on 10 warning signs in your body that you should take care of. 